this is. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, we have a distinguished guest to give us our seminar um, today. Um, it's Tom, Professor Tom Bianchi, who um, has the um, illustrious title as the John and Beverly Thompson Endowed Chair in Geological Sciences at the University of Florida. And he's, as I say, he's a very distinguished guest, has a number of awards to his name, which I will elaborate on all of them in, in full, but his full, Fulbright Research Awards, and is currently here um, as, as a Masters Fellow under the, I guess, the guidance and sponsorship of Bill Austin. And so spending, uh, Tom spending most of his time over in St. Andrews, but I'm uh, delighted to have encouraged him to visit us over this side. He's been mm -hmm. in Glasgow, and um, so very graciously accepted an invitation to come here and uh, to give us a seminar on something which is growing in uh, importance and interest. And I think um, we know from the work that, um, that Mike did recently, this develop, developing interest in, the, I would say, the Scottish Government in general in to this particular topic. So I'm sure that you'll get a, a lot of interested um, audience here, Tom. So welcome. Okay. Thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to your seminar. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. <clears throat> It's nice to be here um, on a typical sunny day. Um, yeah, my first stop was in Glasgow, and so I had a wonderful train trip here yesterday. And it's continuing, so it's fantastic. Uh, um, beautiful place. Um, so as Nick was saying, um, carbon cycling um, is a big topic uh, these days and has been for over a decade. Um, a lot of the people I've worked with on this span across uh, many different arenas and many different fields of study, uh, different organizations, funding, and the main topics, I'll divide this talk into four different main topics. One is sort of these hot spots, where the hot spots are in the coastal margin for preserving carbon and burning carbon, okay, remineralizing carbon. Um, one of the hot spots will be these large river deltas we've been working on in the Mississippi, the Amazon, Ganges, and so on. Uh, these conduits that connect continents with the coastal margin. Um, another one that's more relevant to my visit in Scotland are the fjords, and that's what allowed me to hook up with Craig Smeaton and, and Bill Austin. And then um, carbon sequestration uh, with blue carbon communities um, and I'll give you an example of this really neat system this growing delta this embryonic delta so uh, first we'll start off with the uh, hot spots and um, first thing will be just sort of the idea of pre-industrial and present-day continental shelf activities and without boring you with all these numbers uh, the ocean has largely been a net sink uh, for atmospheric carbon dioxide post-industrial revolution. Now, um, while we published this uh, general theme uh, in, in this paper, um, this, this idea is changing. Uh, there are places where you get more evasion of CO2, particularly at some of these, these big deltas where a lot of carbon is dumped and burned very efficiently. So whether that arrow's going in or out with CO2 is not as easily said in the coastal margin. Again, open ocean uh, folks have that luxury to talk about this more stability, but the coastal ocean, you know, to say any particular place is net source or sink is really, really tough. And so when we, we publish things like this, we have to be, we have to be careful. But, but that particular statement extracted from all these numbers is one of the more uh, things where where um, we felt comfortable saying uh, for most places. Some of these numbers you're not able to see. I've got uh, John Hedges started very early on with sort of the where the carbon is stored in the coastal margin. You've got deltaic sediments, uh, high productivity zones, uh, upwelling zones, shallow carbonate seas, and so on. So you can see these numbers are much lower where the deltaic systems were always viewed as being uh, really the, the, the huge players. Then as you move on to 2005, David Burdage's work, he still talks about 
the deltaic sediments, but then they break it into non-deltaic continental shelf systems, uh, representing huge numbers of, this is of the entire ocean, right? Um, we published another paper uh, modifying this again, and again, sort of the deltaic systems, non-deltaic stay the same, but here's the new player. Fjords now have emerged, and fjords have always been known to be places where there's high sedimentation in some places and high preservation, but their role globally was not really fully appreciated. Um, and then one more modification of that recently would just sort of keep improving that number, and this number actually went up even higher uh, on a global scale. So I'll come back to that. So what controls, um, what controls burial of carbon and sediments? What are the main features um, that, that control that? Well, about 86%, as I showed you in this evolving story uh, of the coastal margin, is preserved in coastal sediments. And why? Uh, sedimentation rates typically very high. Redox conditions changing, so low redox, low oxygen, less efficient respiration. Uh, very, very interesting mineral aggregate associations with minerals on clay particles, very high surface area. Uh, selective preservation based on the chemistry of the organic matter, which is something that we've been interested in with biomarkers. Is there a lot of lignin versus sugars versus amino sugars? How, how um, usable is this material for, for bacteria? Uh, geopolymerization is another aspect of things. It's more well known perhaps in soils but this is not only the molecules that are made within organisms in terms of their overall chemical features, but what happens after the molecules leave, you can get abiotic condensation, and you can take fragments of small molecules and make big molecules that are very difficult to break down, but those macromolecules are not made by biological machinery. That's made outside the cell. So that's kind of the difference between these two. And then another interesting one is the co-precipitation absorption of iron. Again, when you're near the coastal region, there's huge amounts of iron coming off the continents, and iron now has, uh, shown, to be a, has shown to be a really important uh, factor in preserving uh, carbon as well. So these are some of the big players. Uh, but nevertheless, even though this has been going on for many, many years, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's sorting itself out, uh, we still need to know more about the mechanisms, and the more we learn about the chemistry and the more we see how global change is changing the rules and the, the zones, uh, all of these particular things are changing. So while we may understand this very well, as you start to change the boundaries, you might change the flow rate because of more flooding. You might change um, erosion rates. Um, and so on with sea level rise. The boundaries that control these parameters are now changing in the Anthropocene. Okay, so, so while we know a lot about this, as, we, as the Anthropocene is emerging and, and we're learning more about how things are changing, climate's changing here, everywhere you go, um, these things change along with it. Um, if you look here at some of these hot spots, these are some of the ones we'll talk about. Here are the big rivers, fjords, I'll talk a little bit about the work we're doing in the Arctic with permafrost. Um, and then, of course, some of these uh, uh, blue carbon systems, whether it's mangroves or marshes or seagrasses, and what they're involved with. But this, you know, and of course, the oxygen is very important. We have different types of low oxygen. You have low oxygen uh, from these oxygen minimum zones, more associated with upwelling regions. But then you have hypoxia, that's occurring from the fingerprint that we leave. Not only do we leave a large carbon footprint, but wherever humans go, we have a large nitrogen footprint as well. And so as we bleed nitrogen to the coast, uh, we get more eutrophication, more oxygen drawdown. Um, so these are, these are big drivers in these kinds of systems. One of the interesting things um, that the biogeochemical community has um, started to think about, which I, it's a fundamental thing in geology, but it was a wonderful uh, paper by Blair and Aller where they took the fundamental features 
of, of the margin. It's an active margin and a passive margin. And looked at carbon cycling and some of the ramifications. So if you have very steep margins, you have a short residence time. Uh, t typhoons passing through Taiwan, where you can have huge amounts of forested inputs, right, terrestrial inputs to the global ocean really quickly with very, very little processing. Uh, we see this down in New Zealand as well, where you just have size, you know, these huge landslips of, of, of forested material making its way. When you have a scenario like that, uh, you have typically modern carbon. It could be trees and vegetation. But there's huge amounts of kerogen because of the intensity of that erosion. So it's deep gouging erosion, not surface level flow. Uh, major losses of, 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 of surface sediments and so on. Um, and then you get some modern marine material out here and so on. But not much of the aged or, or sort of older detrital type material. If you look at, uh, sorry, if you look at the, um, something like the Amazon basin, uh, where you have this long period of time, uh, you, you come off the Andes, but then you have this huge uh, lowland floodplain, and you can recycle the material continuously. Here it injects ra rapidly. So as you recycle that, you get modern and aged terrestrial material. You get a bit of, um, a bit of this kerogen, you know, that makes its way from, let's say, the Andes, if we're talking about that. And then you have this very shallow passive margin where you get even more of that and quite a bit of marine uh, over here with, with more phytoplankton in some cases. Of course, some of these margins have upwelling, but uh, so this could vary. Again, these maps are general. So, so if you look at the large river deltaic systems, these are the major conduits in which the continents drain uh, um, into these large deltaic systems. One of the things I'll be talking about uh, in these systems that's very important are what we call mobile mud belts. Okay, so you have the delta proper, and then you have these mobile muds that are not consolidated mud, but they move around, they stay very fluidized, uh, and they're extremely efficient at burning carbon. So they've, they've lots of bacteria, they're constantly oxidized, they're sliding around uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 centimeters deep, and it's very unique to these large deltaic systems. So even though you bury a lot of carbon in these systems, we burn a tremendous amount as well. Um, fjords, of course, uh, are part of the classification of, of estuarine systems. Um, and they're all different features of these fjords depending upon the historical geomorphology of the sills and so on. But these systems tend to have very poor circulation, high residence time, and you get this stratified water. I'm sorry. You get this stratified water um, with um, low oxygen. The Arctic is um, essentially undergoing huge changes, as you, you all well know, but not only just with temperature rise, and, and most people think about um, thawing of the ice, but the, the, the physical features of the landscape are changing dramatically. Uh, there's many, many more fires. The thaw down depth of the soils is increasing. Uh, all of this permafrost is now starting to uh, thaw and make its way into the uh, watershed and it's moving towards the coast and this is one of the things we've also been looking at as you move across from the uplands and forested areas uh, and then all of these tundra ponds that start to open up as a result of this thaw. Um, <clears throat> and then finally the blue carbon centric approach is where you have these, this is making mangroves look a lot larger on a global scale, so this is blue carbon centric uh, where you have mangroves marshes, seagrasses, and you can see they sequester lots of carbon compared to the deep ocean, which has to make its way kilometers, and you see much, much less carbon stored there. So this is a very rapid way to take up CO2 and bury it. And the reason why you get a lot more carbon being buried here than you do, let's say, in the more tr traditional terrestrial systems, uh, it, if you look here, uh, it's tremendously different. These are 
temperate forests compared to blue carbon. And so what is it about the blue carbon that makes them unique in burying carbon compared to a boreal forest? And it's the redox, right? So, so this isn't true of all freshwater uh, marsh systems either, as you know, and, and there's big questions about what's going on in the peatlands of Scotland and whether it's staying stable or not, but there's big problems with methane released from there. So the thing you don't have with these salty uh, systems is that you've got sulfate reduction. So it pushes methane down and it's a rapid way to store it. That's something I think people get confused. They just assume all wetlands must be blue carbon. And the whole idea of the blue carbon is that it's salty. And saltiness is linked essentially uh, with this. So that's a way of getting it down into this system. Okay, so uh, this is just another way. Uh, so we can preserve those environments and have them help uh, control CO2, or, or we can start to do it on our own. This is one of the first uh, commercial systems for capturing. It's just, just, they just started it up in uh, Switzerland um, and you know, basically sits on this waste heat recovery system and fans push air through. I'm sorry again. I'll have to stop doing that. Um, eventually, the CO2 gets collected on these cartridges, and then you can sort of sep separate that uh, at a higher temperature and then pipe that underground and grow vegetables and various things. But, you know, is this really the way to go? Uh, it, it's not this or get rid of the wetlands. Uh, again, the coastal blue carbon systems are threatened because of human development on the coast, so that's why people are trying to raise that issue again. We've known that marshes store carbon for many years. That's not new. So this whole blue carbon slant is more in the context of losing more of these, these communities that are working for our benefit. But a lot of the critics of this say that this is not the way you, you should do it. You need to go to the stack where it's being in, released and actually have scrubbers of some sort to remove it there rather than trying to just pull it out willy-nilly anywhere in the, in the world. But Bill Gates and some of the other millionaires are supporting these kinds of competitions that uh, people contribute proposals to and things like that. So this is one of them. Um, hats, I mean, hats off to them uh, because you know what my president thinks. Um, so it's just nice to see anything along these lines and uh, so you'll find no criticism from me but for the more stauncher critics they, they say this is not the way to go so okay I'll take you quickly we'll talk a little bit about some of our research sites the Colville a bit in s southern Alaskan fjords uh, a big river system here the Mississippi the Yangtze I go to China quite frequently and then uh, New Zealand fjords where some of uh, your um, native uh, uh, Scots down in Dunedin and Otago. Mm -hmm. I froze down there for a winter. They, they have these small houses. They, they think they live on the North Island with the climate, but you freeze down there. It's just really, really but beautiful, absolutely gorgeous area, but just not a place to be in the winter. Um, so I won't, I've removed a number of biomarker slides. I won't drag you through that. I know it's more of an ecological group, some biogeo folks here, but this is just the macromolecule of lignin, uh, structural support molecule in terrestrial plants. We can break it down into these small monomers and then look at where lignin is. So if you see lignin in the coastal margin, right, it means it came from land unless you're talking about seagrasses, right? That would be the only source of lignin. So it's a, it's a tracer of terrestrial. And we need to have a, bo a molecule to trace terrestrial carbon in the coastal margin because that's a huge component. Okay, so big rivers, I told you before, you have these mobile muds and fluid muds that just don't really consolidate very well. Um, if we look at off the Mississippi <clears throat> River here in Louisiana, you can see these little bullseyes are hot spots of deposition that we measure using... Uh, Beryllium-7, you don't need to worry too much about that. But all you're seeing here are the hot spots where you see deposition of sediment. 
So the first thing when you start looking at carbon cycling in the coastal margin, you need to know something about the delivery, right? And so you have to work with people that are sedimentologists or have some knowledge about where the material is being dumped. If you don't have a handle on that, you can just go out sampling and you'll not know where to sample. You need to know what the primary depositional pathway is. So we use radionuclides to determine that. And this changes seasonally. Um, and then you can go and you can start looking at carbon burial. This is in grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And here at the Mississippi Canyon out here. Uh, but you can sort of get an idea. And, and this moves around. Again, it's a very, very dynamic system because the mobile muds are moving all around here. And they're burning carbon, they're burying carbon, some of it gets shifted out to the canyon. Very, very complex. Without the radionuclides, you just don't have a map to go after looking at where the carbon is. And you know, a lot of the, the biomarker people who don't want to deal with that uh, tend to get lost. You know, they're interested in their techniques and GCMS and LCMS, and it's like, well, I don't want to know about the deposition and they want it, you know, they can measure all these compounds and they're measuring them in the wrong place. So it's really important, I uh, can't stress that enough with having the sedimentary dynamics. Um, now this is a busy diagram but I only want you to look where the two red arrows are. This is going out off the shelf from the river out and the one thing I just want to show you, the first thing is that if you look at this one, this is lignin concentration so you go from near shore all the way out to the canyon and lignin drops off. And you might say, well, that's just dilution from phytoplankton carbon, right? So the lignin from the river that's terrestrial is getting diluted as you go offshore. That would be one interpretation. But what's nice about biomarkers is that when you look at this particular concentration, this is the acid aldehyde, this is a decay signature. So this does, means that it's actually it's actually being decomposed. So the idea that lignin just decomposes by fungi and forest and things like that, which many people thought for a long time is just subaerially decomposed, once lignin enters the marine environment, there's nothing there to break it down. That's not true because you get these already previously partially broken down products that are entering, and then they get further broken down. So it's partially true that the only thing that can really open up the ring structure of a lignin molecule are, you know, white rot fungi. But that's opened up by the time it makes its way to the coast in many cases, and then you can further break it down. So this is happening by marine bacteria. They're breaking down lignin. Um, one of the other interesting things off the Louisiana or Mississippi coast, and again, don't worry about all of this. This is lignin concentration. Here's the uh, year uh, from the... Uh, led to 10 chronology. I just want to point out these peaks in lignin correspond with these interesting peaks in hurricane activity. So as you move hurricanes through this area, it's another thing you need to factor in in terms of the way carbon gets redistributed. And one of the interesting things is we actually see peaks in lignin. Most people think of hurricanes moving material in, but one of the things that happens with hurricanes is that you get so much rainfall here, you know, you get this wave of material moving in, but then you get this huge drainage. So what's happening is that you're seeing these peaks of lignin draining the continent and being stored here as you pass these big hurricanes through. You have to factor in these features, and again, with global change, more and more of this unpredictability is going to make us scratch our heads about how to interpret this. Um, the work we're doing in China uh, off the Yangtze or Changjiang uh, and the Yellow River, Huanghe uh, River, is, um, relates to, again, these are mobile muds. Uh, all in here, very fine uh, material, uh, silty, muddy material. And the reason why you see the mobile muds stay very, very close to the coast is because of the physical oceanography. Uh, there's a very, very strong shearing effect of these currents that pretty much push the mobile muds to hug along the coast here. And that's another 
interesting physical driver uh, of where you get carbon stored or burned in these big deltaic systems. One of the interesting things, you talk about burn down in mobile muds. So if you look at places like rivers, and this is total carbon over uh, surface area. Um, so basically this very fine material. The oligotrophic ocean uh, has very, very low carbon uh, in the deep ocean relative to surface area, the particles. You look at upwelling zones, here's the deep ocean. Look at the mobile muds. Uh, this is right off the coast, so it's, it's, it's even lower than the oligotrophic deep ocean. And the reason for that is because of the burn down rate in these mobile muds. So you might be saying, I thought you just said that large river deltas bury a lot of carbon. And they do, but they burn so much of this material. That's why I say, depending upon whether the CO2 is coming out or CO2 is going in, depends upon the discharge of the river at any particular time. So you can't really say it's a net source or a net sink at any particular time. But there's a huge amount of CO2 being burned off. Um, but nevertheless, they still store a lot of carbon just because of the sheer amount of material coming in. If you look now, if we go to the Arctic, uh, so we move away from, that was my example with the large rivers. The Colville is the largest, uh, in North, largest drainage base in North America that's continuous permafrost. Um, it gets input from a variety of different materials, peats, uh, benthos, algal production, and also yedema. I don't know how many of you know what yedema is, but it's a word you'll see more and more. Yedema is this really organic rich material formed in the Pleistocene. It's very icy and watery, but the carbon in the yedema that you find in permafrost is very, very unique. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So one of the things we find is we sample, again, off from the Colville Delta, uh, we found a new biomarker that's very good for tracking peat. Um, again, one of these uh, lipids. Um, but one of the interesting things we see, again, is with the discharge of the river, you see very high inputs of lignin. This lambda is just a, uh, an indicator of lignin. So we're seeing this pulsing of lignin. Now most of the high flow in the, in the, in the Arctic rivers happens just a, a few weeks. And it's, you need to just get out of the way when it starts to happen because there's large chunks of ice moving downstream. We really can't get in the river and sample. It's extremely dangerous. I mean, you get around some of these areas on where the river turns, it's taken small towns out by the actual ice gouging and flow. I mean, towns disappear, so when, and the thaw is getting more and more each year. So when things really sort of go from ice to flow in the, in up, up there, that's a big problem for many of the sampling problems we have. But it's, it's really quite amazing. Um, so we're seeing definitely transport of this permafrost make it to the coast. And these are, these are the sampling areas we have in coastal, and you can see this is the permafrost that you, you start to see thawing. And one of the big areas we see here is, is bank erosion. Uh, huge amounts of bank erosion occurring uh, up in here. So a lot of this has permafrost in it and this yedema material. Now the interesting thing about yedema is that, this is a name from one of the local tribes, um, the origin of that name, but Yedema is a type of carbon that does not follow what we typically think of with aging of carbon. Normally, most biologists, whatever, you look at aging of carbon, the older it gets, the less usable it is, because all the goodies have been taken out. This is sort of like flash-frozen carbon. It's sort of like flash-frozen peas or something like that. It has all the nutrients still stored in it, from the Pleistocene, because it didn't age for a long period of time. It was frozen relatively quickly. So what you find now is that as the yedema in the permafrost is making its way to the coast, it's being utilized very quickly by bacteria. So that's really even worse news. So not only do you have clathrates releasing CO2 directly, but the carbon is really fresh. It's like fresh phytoplankton carbon. And it's thousands of years old. 20,000 year old carbon, we feed it to bacteria, they consume it over minutes. It makes no sense. But again, it's a whole, the rules are different in the Arctic. 
This is a really cool story we just published in LNO, that you can take something like a gastrotrich that lives a few days, feed it yedema, and before it dies, it's thousands of years old. So there are ducks and all of these. It, it, it's interesting you have this ancient carbon getting into the modern communities. So the ducks that are on the water may be 8,000 years old. And it's just, I'm not quite sure what it means in carbon cycling. It's more of a novel thing. When you, it, it means when you go up there with radiocarbon tools, you really need to be mindful of this. <clears throat> okay, fjords. Uh, down to... Uh, where your compatriots are in the South Island. This is uh, Fjordland, a absolutely magnificent area. About, I tell this to other people, maybe this doesn't shock people, but about six to sometimes seven meters of rain. Uh, beautiful area, steep slopes, shallow soils, and then these landslides. So again, rapid input into these fjords, and they preserve, we published this, we able to get on the front cover here. Again, it's just absolutely gorgeous area. Um, so if you look at organic carbon uh, accumulation rate in different er areas of the world, <clears throat> here's New Zealand, here are all these areas that we, we looked at. Here's the thing that really sticks out. This is total organic carbon by oceanic sediment type. Here's what we talked about earlier, non-deltaic, deltaic. Fjord, you know, looks pretty impressive. But when you area normalize it, the fjords jump up, right? I mean, think about it. 11% globally, and now that we've got that number up to almost 20. People were shocked by that. They said, this just aren't, this just not that much aerial coverage of fjords in the globe. It, it's not, almost nothing. So when you area normalize that, the contribution for the fjords goes way up. Um, another area that we've looked at in southern part of Alaska, you have these really, really amazing systems that are quite different. Some of the northern ones have uh, active glacial input, and the southern ones are more phytoplankton-driven uh, based on the exchange with the coastal ocean. And then when you look at the uh, organic carbon that's buried in these systems, um, you can see in the non-glaciated southern systems, a good deal of it is mostly marine storage that's being buried. But in the, in the more northern systems where you have active glaciers, these are huge numbers. I mean, the glaciers are essentially being bulldozers and pushing this carbon in that's being rapidly buried. And so these are some of the highest numbers ever recorded uh, in these glaciated systems. Um, so again, you don't really have the glaciated systems in Fjordland, in, in New Zealand. They're not contributing to that. So this was a different story in South, Southeast Alaska where we have the phytoplankton uh, dominated and then the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, petrogenic or this really old petrogenic material, ancient carbon that's being pushed in, uh, some terrigenous material, plant material, and then marine. I didn't explain those three. But of course, in the glaciated, you see much more of this older petrogenic material. Okay, so, and then uh, Craig Smeaton, who came over to work in my lab uh, for a couple of weeks, a graduate student with Bill Austin, <clears throat> St. Andrews, uh, they're starting to now model places in, uh, in Scotland. And that, again, that's one of the reasons I'm here in, in talking to them about ways to actually track carbon they're more interested in bulk carbon and sedimentation, and they're, they're more sedimentologists than they are uh, organic geochemists. And so that, that's one of the things we're doing. But they, they had a really nice paper in looking at uh, predicting, you know, without with taking fewer samples and doing more with it to model what the total carbon is. Because, you know, most of the carbon storage in Scotland, again, is believed it's, it's famous for the peat storage. But, um, and there's arguments about how stable that's been over the last decade or so, whether it's losing it or not, and you have conflicting arguments on that. But the one thing that hasn't been in discussion until Craig and some of the others is just really how important the fjords have been and how that's an underestimated uh, sink uh, with most, as I said, most of the previous discussion, for good, for good reason, 
being on the huge uh, peach stores. Okay, my final section is on the sequestration. A few slides here and we're done. Um, this is a prograding new embryonic delta. Most of the deltas I've shown you before are thousands of years old, five, six thousand years old. This is a delta that was formed from an outlet that was created accidentally by the construction, you know, this whole Louisiana coastline has been tremendously modified and is undergoing extensive erosion. This is one of the few places where new land is being created. And it was created by making this canal that was provided for flood relief back in the 40s. And we know exactly how old everything is because you've got a chrono sequence. So the closer you are, obviously the older, mid, and then this is all. Uh, so you can see this is the sandy material. Here's a 26-year-old, about 38-year-old. So what a unique situation to actually look at changing vegetation, changing sedimentation on a highly erosive coastline in this unique field laboratory where we're growing new, new coast. Um, and that's what we did. And we published a paper that I'm not going to talk the details about, but we did look at iron, uh, and iron accounts for about 15% of the organic carbon that gets buried in this system is associated with reactive iron. Okay, so in some way, the iron either sorbs on to oxyhydroxides, or you get iron two coming up in the dissolved form from the anoxic sediments, and as it precipitates, it takes carbon with it. That's called co-precipitation. So there's two mechanisms. You can stick to something that's already coming in oxidized, or you can take dissolved organic carbon and complex it in a precipitation uh, a pathway. And then we start looking at uh, the thickness of the delta with respect to mean lower low water and what that means with carbon. So this is getting sort of the geomorphology of the delta. Uh, look at all these vibracores. We did not take all those vibracores, but I'm, I just love showing that. Usually we have four or three, but these were all taken by Exxon in search for natural gas, and we were able to have access. But normally you never get that. But it's absolutely wonderful for creating these kinds of, of, of models. So just wonderful uh, resolution. And then we can do this kind of thing. I had this, I just have to show you this. I had this in these colors, and we're publishing this now in Nature Geoscience, and they made us put it in this colors. You know why? Colorblind. So I thought that was interesting. I never had a journal ever tell me uh, to change the color code for that reason. But so that's 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 the um, I, I, yeah a politically correct way to do it. All right. So anyway, um, and so so you can see. We're actually getting carbon stocks, and you can see how that's related to uh, the depth. Um, and when you look at the carbon sequestration, here's sort of a typical number, which is, you know, Chimura published this some years back. It, this is, these are all our stations, a few of the stations where we measured carbon sequestration. So it's, it's actually quite high, and I think some of that has to do with the fact that this is an embryonic system. So it is different. It's young, it's active, it's, acc it's accreting, it's got new growth, it has trees, it has shrubs, and it has microalgae, you know, in those three habitats. And so, very, very different. And then my final slide, uh, no, I have one more after this, is just sort of this work that we've done looking at blue carbon around the entire coast of the U.S. And again, this comes back to the active passive margin, right? So the East Coast, the East Coast is much more passive margin. West Coast is active margin. Gulf Coast is passive margin. And you can see the West Coast is minimal. That's not a shocker because, I mean, I've done estuarine work my whole life. Most of the estuarine work and most of the estuarine scientists are on the Gulf and on the East Coast, right? If you're on the West Coast, you're studying upwelling and things like that. Um, there are a few people out there that like to say we still have estuaries and we have a few fjords, but it's really all about the deep, deep water. 
Um, so when you get in these passive margins, you can see the differences in um, some of these, these numbers in teragrams and you know, the color coded here. So my final message here, uh, this is the final slide, is one of the big things that has been developed uh, over the last decade or so, this is represented in Korover's work, is uh, critical zone science. This is a big buzzword in National Science Foundation. Critical zone observatories, CZOs. You have to have acronyms. And so CZOs are a big thing, but mostly in the terrestrial systems. Now, the terrestrial systems, as we all know, is anyone who samples from a boat, you know, we can't go out and stand on where we're looking and carve out plots and different things like that that the terrestrial scientists have the advantage of. So they can draw lines and they can draw, draw these divisions much easier than we can. But I think that's one of the things we need to actually start doing better in following this critical zone science because if you looked at a lot of what I talked to you about today, I kept saying things are shifting, right? You know, the mobile muds are over here, or there's erosion here, or the depot center's here. And if there's a flood or a typhoon, it goes from here to here. And so, yes, we think about ecotones, and certainly, you know, in classical uh, uh, ecology books, we've known about zonation in the intertidal zone. I'm not suggesting that's new. That's some of the real dogma from marine scientists that has made its way into the classic, the, eco, the pure ecologist that allows the first thing they allowed in from the marine crowd, right, was, was the intertidal stuff. So that's not new, but in terms of biogeochemical cycling, I think we need to do that more. And so what I started with earlier, with these systems as you go across different latitudes, I think we need to have these demarcations and consider you know, when, when I say it's really burning a lot of carbon off the Yangtze River, the first question should be, is that in the near shore, mid shore, or offshore uh, region? You can't say it for that whole area. And I think we tend to sort of clump things that way, and, and we're not as mindful of that because of our limitation of sampling and because we don't see it. If you're on a ship, you don't see that. If you're standing in a forest, you see those zones, and you tend to talk about that more. Uh, so we typically talk about off the Mississippi River, off the coast of Florida. Where? And those zones need to be more important, and I think it just comes back to, to this uh, critical zone. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for attending and so on. Some yeah, questions. sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. I, before we take a question, I was fascinated to hear your, your uh, reference to fluidized muds. muds. So, so I published a paper many years ago about fluidized, naturally occurring fluidized bed reactors in estuaries. Yeah, okay. is that okay? And yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there you go. Rather longer ago than I yeah, yeah. remember, but there you go. Absolutely, okay. yeah. No, no, they, no, I mean, they are fascinating areas. Actually. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. Very, very, they just chew up. Uh, this is nitrogen stuff. It's amazing how quickly they chew up organic matter. Anyway, questions? Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to show my total ignorance as an ecologist. Yeah. I mean, it seems that the kind of the place that, that are accumulating more than anything uh, are those places where the, the habitat's actually growing. So. The, the air deltas are changing in extent. Yeah. The sediment's thickening in in, yes. in sea locks. Is there is there no limit to those to those growth processes? Yeah, I know. So ultimately, the, the whole should, the whole thing just should slow down and and kind of things will. will yeah, I mean, well, the limitation yeah. eventually. Well, you start to change the redox, so the redox works in favor of storage, right? Okay. So so as you get thicker, and you you interfere with oxygen diffusion. That's good for storing carbon. Um, what, what happens, though, is as you stick your neck out more and you, you get taller or grow this way, then you open yourself up to more physical forces, right? So while you're growing this high, if the shearing current's up here, you eventually move up into a current maybe you didn't 
or you move out into a zone where the wave action. Mm -hmm. So I think what happens is that as you get bigger and you use all the redox to grow and sedimentation to grow, then eventually you become constrained by physics, which starts introducing not only physical erosion, but oxygen, right? Because with the physical forces, you would vect and diffuse oxygen into there. And that's what we see. The one thing I'll just quickly mention was that one of the cool things we're doing, we just worked on this with blue carbon, as you start eroding peat from Florida, this is Florida peat, um, from old marshes, as that blue carbon starts to get eroded with sea level rise, most people would think, well, it's thousands, it's six, eight thousand years old. It's just going to go get reburied somewhere in the, in the margin. Nothing's going to be converted to CO2. But we're working a lot on priming. And priming is a process by which you take very labile molecules in soil. It's well known in the soils, root exudates and so on. Around these root exudates, you have amino acids and all these things being secreted. You activate the microbial community. And while they're eating the goodies, they, can, they eat recalcitrant. That's the idea of priming. So I introduced this paper in 2011 in PNAS, and now priming in the marine environment's really taken off. So that's sort of just a, a primer for you to what, what I'm going to say. So as you, we start seeing this old peat being released from sea level rise, we did some priming experiments. It's getting broken down in the coastal environment via priming. So if you put it in with a lot of algal cells compared to just nothing at all, and, and you, have to, you have to do these experiments very carefully because if you mix it with algae and you say, oh, I see more CO2 coming out, it just could be that it's eating the algae. But if you have the, the peat source where you can identify the radiocarbon as CO2, right? if more of that's coming out in the presence of algae, then you know that the algal exudates are priming that peat and it's getting converted to CO2. So there's bugs in the coastal environment, microbes, that are capable of doing that. And they become the dominant population then, compared to the ones that eat phytoplankton for a living. Well, that, that actually is, is very relevant to a question I wanted to ask, actually. Yeah. That was about the um, degradation of the lignin that you showed. Yeah. And cause I, I remember, I'd, I mean, I'm way behind on the literature on this, but I know certainly when I was very active, there was hardly anybody doing anything on marine fungi. And so what I was wondering was actually this, this degradation in the sea and everything. Could that actually be fungi, or, is it, or could it be this primate? Yeah. Okay. You, you, you've hit on a perfect question. That's a great question. There's a new paper that just came out that made me so excited this year on sinking uh, uh, marine snow in the, in, in the deep ocean where they find lots of these Basidomycetes. And I don't know why it went missing. We've been saying this for a long time that we think the only people that there was a very small community, there was about six people that would talk to each other at every ASLO meeting. Mm -hmm. The fungi people in Sapelo Island that would, you know, Jack, uh, Steve Newell, and some of these other people. And they talked about fungi in coastal so marshes. On one hand, right? Yes, yeah. but there's a small group. And I've always wondered about that. So now it's very, very interesting. You bring up something that we're really, really hot on right now in terms of looking at the role of that. So yeah, they may very well be more important than we, we ever dreamed of. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just don't understand why that went dark for so long. Well, I mean, this, the, the, the obvious sort of corollary is pro you know. I mean, we didn't, yes. you know, look what the heck That's exactly. Did. And we didn't even know they were there. That's a good example. Yeah. That's true. I mean, if you say, how, did they, how could they how have they missed that? that? Yeah. And some of that was because of the filters they were using. You know, obviously they were going through the GFFs and... But, uh, but, but yeah, this, this, just, this just came out, and uh, it's just got everyone all excited about, about that. So good, very timely question, yeah. I was just adding to that. I mean, we're finding a lot of bacteria that live with algae, specialize in aliphatic degradation. Uh -huh. Also, um, are highly fastidious aromatic degraders. Uh -huh. And we have sort of thought, well, that's probably because these aromatics are coming from the algae, which they probably are, but there definitely seems to be an association. So your priming experiment might make sense. Yeah. These bacteria, quite a lot of them have a number of systems for catecholate degradation, but also for you know, benzene degradation and so on. Right. 
Yeah, and, and you, you probably know the literature from, um, you know, the, the big event that happened with the oil uh, mm -hmm. explosion and all of that, that, you know, is probably the best place to have a spill, even though you don't tell politicians that, because it's a bright, sunny area, so you get photo, photochemical breakdown. But more importantly, which we didn't have up in Alaska and some of the other places where we've had these disastrous spills and so on, natural seeps. So the natural seep, there have been tar balls on the beaches of the Gulf of Mexico for long before humans were there. And so the natural seeps have kept this smaller bacterial community that can feed on that for a living. And then they looked at the abundance of those. You know, now it's not, no longer a black box with bacteria, right? So now all the metagenomics, all those people went out and you could see that it went from the normal bacterial community that eat phytoplankton for a living, and it was dominated by these seep, and they were just chewing it up. So that was a huge advantage to have natural, but most places don't have that history and so on. But that was another big, big player in breaking that down. I mean, it went away really fast. <laughs> I mean, relatively speaking, I mean, it was disastrous, but honestly, that was really amazingly resilient of that system, despite all the horrible things you see with birds and yeah. mammals and, th I mean, no doubt, but amazing, amazing. And, and the methane that was produced, we were funded to go out and look at some methane. The methane numbers were a million times higher than normal because there was a huge amount of methane that came out. It wasn't just oil. And we thought that this would be a great place to go look at what might be a futuristic view of the Arctic, yeah. you know, this big belch to the atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. It never made it out. And so one of the most amazing things was that not only did the concentrations reach a million times higher, we didn't see it come out. So what came along with that was some of the highest methane oxidation rates ever observed on the planet. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that happened microbially, separate from the guys that were chewing on the, the oil, Amazing, amazing resilience. I mean, it really was a very pleasing thing to see in terms of the ability to see Earth kind of reset the stage, but anyway. Very good. So is this potentially a climate change mitigation action that you could take these bacteria and take them up to the Arctic when methane is released into the normal water column? A bit of geoengineering. Yeah. And also, if you have oil spills, could you just take the bacteria and chuck it in? Well, I mean, you know that's been on the plate for a long time. In fact, in the Gulf of Mexico, they do have these bacteria that they've introduced already in some of these spills. I mean, the Gulf is cowboy country. It's pretty wild. I mean, they do what they want to do in the Gulf. It's pretty wild compared to the east and west coast, uh, Louisiana and these places. And so th things happen there. Um, and so they have already done that. And they have these bacteria that you can, <laughs> but of course, they have no idea what what the fate of that bacteria will be. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think, I don't know. I, I don't, you'd have to talk to more of the, the, the microbial people. I wouldn't dare answer that question. They, they know much more about it than I do. Can I add to that? What you want is healthy primary production. Because, again, with algal cultures that we look at the land here, but if you look at the surface ocean, there's a lot of the phytotrophic organisms in there. Yeah. Whether they can oxidize methane is, is an unknown question. Uh -huh. We know very, very little about yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, there's only a few people around the world who are looking at a coal morrow as one. Yeah. Um, and again, for the aromatic degradation, aromatics, algal prime, healthy primary production prime. sustains this low level, fasti highly fastidious oil degrading bacterial community. Uh -huh. and then, when you get an oil spill, then they just take over. They become 60% as opposed to 0.1% of the abundance. In that exactly. Um, so, Health primary production. Again, the Gulf of Mexico is a highly productive system, and I think that would be a, an important component as well as the natural seeps. Yes. System. Um, but, yeah. but yeah, so the Arctic health primary production, that's the best thing you can do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't go near that one. That would, you know, the advice on taking microbes and putting them somewhere to fix things and the engineering, I just I shut my mouth when I need to on that one. Of the question more thought. I found the Yedema factory interesting. It's the first yeah. time I heard about it actually. I have to admit. Uh -huh. um, 
And you mentioned that they store lots of carbon, but also lots of nutrients. So I assume also a lot of iron when it's flushed to the coast. Has anybody looked into effects on the coastal fauna? Let's say, because I assume if it's rich in nutrients, you have a lot of eutrophication and then risk in hypoxia or even switch from the community to anoxia. Yeah, well, well actually, um, when I talked about the nutrients and the iron and so on, that's not really so much part of the edema. Because I jumped around, which is a little confusing. I was talking about different coastlines. The Edema story is really, it's just mostly about the carbon, the quality of the carbon. So you have a lot of these rivers in Siberia that are just draining. That's where most of the continuous permafrost is. And you have these blackwater rivers, not, not, very, not very particle rich, high DOC. And they're draining and they're bringing this permafrost that gets released more and more as you increase the thaw depth e each year. And um, yeah, I mean, what they do, people have taken these, um, you know, they go out and they can measure CO2 uptake and, I mean, CO2 release and look at, at, at the uptake of this material. And it's just amazing, 20, 30,000 year old carbon. Uh, and so I don't think you, you don't need the iron cycle. You don't need the, I shouldn't say you don't need it, but I mean, it, from what we know about the Yedema story is that it's just very high, it's, it's like phytoplankton, exudate, and it's 30,000 years old. As I say, it just was flash frozen, uh, relatively speaking, and so it totally changes the story uh, in terms, but it, it, that's a bit scary when you think about how much of that stuff is gonna get burned off, you know, CO2 or, or methane, whatever. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. My, I guess the, the short answer is, you know, the, the iron and the nutrient story is not so much part of that. I guess that's a short answer. That was more part of the, the other more eutrophied coastlines and, and places where there's a lot of particulate iron coming in. These are more black water systems that are just draining tea-like tea rivers. Okay. So, as well as it's, uh, the warming that we get, and projecting CO2 in the atmosphere, coupled with that is a decrease in pH. Yeah. Um, and so I was just speculatively in sort of shallow coastal zones, if you're having a decrease in pH, is that likely to, to change, for example, you talked about iron and speciation of iron and absorption of goods, yeah. how might that affect, as well as warming that gives us an increase in carbon, yeah. but how might the output change due to acidification? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And Wei Zhen Kai published a paper uh, maybe two years ago. It's one of the first examples of, I guess you'd call coastal acidification in a river-dominated region off the Mississippi. And um, so, yes, they are seeing this slight effect of eutrophication that's resulted in huge amounts of CO2 being produced that feed into the DIC and lower the, the pH. Um, again, the problem with the study, unlike an open ocean study, is that it depends on where you are, you know, the inner, middle, or outer field of the plume, right? You can't just say the Mississippi plume or the Yangtze River plume. You have to, inner, middle, outer field, what? Which one? So it depends, and it depends on what season, what discharge, you know, the, the typical mess of the coastal zone that many of the open ocean people don't deal with with some of the, the larger scale uh, ocean acidification questions and classic work that's been done. So you're right on with that, though, um, in terms of, of, um, of these areas with this high levels of, of, of heterotrophic breakdown and burning of carbon, you know, there's got to be some consequences with pH. But, um, so that's just a door that's opening, just opening now. I, I know of that one paper that's in one of these environments. But yeah, you're right, it's been, that's mostly the open water systems. Okay, I think we, it's one o'clock. Sure. So um, thank you very much again, John. Lots of really interesting things to get. Thanks. Thank you very much. About yeah. Our tea so uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you're, I'm not sure of Tom's timing. So you ran. So Tom is around this afternoon. Um, find Natalie. She will be able to guide you to it. <laughs>
Okay, yeah, be happy to chat with you. Right. Thanks. Someone else yeah. from the